Okay, good morning, uh, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, <clears throat> Hokyoji's uh, Sunday morning Dharma talk. <clears throat> Today I have the pleasure of uh, introducing Shodo Spring. And uh, Shodo is a Dharma heir of Shohaku Okamura. Her first teacher was Katagiri Roshi. Uh, Shoto's practice focuses on our relationship with all sentient beings through an organization called Mountains and Waters Alliance. Uh, in 1988, she spent a year at Hokyoji uh, with daily practice with the trees and the hills. And in 2013, she walked across the Great Plains in the Compassionate Earth Walk. She's working on her second book, and thank you for joining us today, Shodo. We look forward to uh, hearing what you have to say. And so, please um, take it away. Thank hey, you. Good morning. Happy to see you all. Um, so, I came up with this phrase, Earth Apprenticeship, several years ago. And I recently found it in maybe a brochure in which I said, we apprentice ourselves to the living earth. I have had a strong feeling that this concept is based in Zen teaching. And what I did for this talk was investigate that thought. It's like it's best not to assume that I actually am in tune with the teachings. So I had a delightful time looking up things, and I'm just going to offer some stories to start off with. Um, first one being Buddha at Vulture Peak, the time when he didn't say anything, but he picked up a flower. So it says he picked a Kampara, golden lotus flower, from the ground and held it in front of them. Only Mahakashapa smiled. Then Buddha said, I have picked this flower and shown it to you. Beyond the flower, beyond its life and its form, there is something beyond words. Birth and death are one. That which is beyond birth and death or form and no form is something that cannot be expressed in words. There is a Dharma gate of truth beyond words and thoughts accessible to you, to you through your own inner experience. So I'm not going to comment yet. Um, and then we have several stories, mostly from Valley Sounds Mountain Colors in the Tanahashi translation. Oh. In Song, China, there was a man who called himself Layman Dongpo. He was originally named Shi of the Su family, and his initiatory name was Zidan. A literary genius, he studied the way of dragons and elephants in the ocean of awakening. He descended deep chasms and soared freely through clouds. One night, when Dong Po visited Mount Lu, he was enlightened upon hearing the sound of the valley stream. He composed the following verse, which he presented to Chang Zong. Valley sounds are the long, broad tongue. Mountain colors are no other than the unconditioned body. 84,000 verses are heard throughout the night. What can I say about this in the morning? Xiang, my pronunciation is getting worse. Xiang Yang Zhixian studied at the assembly of Guishan Lingyo. After years of book study, he gave up and became a cooking monk for some years. Later, he meant to went to Mount Wudong and built himself a hut. For company, he planted some bamboo. One day, while he was sweeping the path, 
a pebble flew up and struck a bamboo. At the unexpected sound, Xing Yang had thorough awakening. He presented a poem to Guishan, who said, this fellow has gone through. One spring day after practicing for 30 years, Ling Yong, who would later become Zen master Zhi Kun, Zhi Xin, walked into the mountains. While resting, he saw peach blossoms in full bloom in a distant village and was suddenly awakened. He wrote this poem, which he presented to Guishan. For 30 years, I have looked for a sword master. Many times leaves fell, new ones sprouted. One glimpse of peach blossoms. Now, no more doubts, just this. Guishan approved him, saying, one who enters with ripened conditions will never leave. And then Dogen says, who does not enter with ripened causes? Who enters and then goes away? This awakening is not limited to Lingyong. If mountain colors were not the unconditioned body, how could this awakening have appeared? And then we have more of Dogen. Know that without mountain colors and valley sounds, Shakyamuni Buddhas, Shakyamuni Buddhas taking up the flower and Huekas attaining the marrow would not have taken place. Because of the power of valley sounds and mountain colors, the Buddha with the great earth and sentient being simultaneously attains the way and countless Buddhas become enlightened upon seeing the morning star. Such skin bags are earlier sages whose aspiration for seeking is profound. People today should be inspired by predecessors like these. Authentic study, free of concern for fame and gain, should be based on such aspiration. So now I'll make a few comments. Um, so Dogen gets very explicit. Without mountain colors and valley sounds, none of the great way of awakening would even happen. Because of valley sounds and mountain colors, the Buddha and the great earth and all sentient beings attain the way. As he said, as the Buddha said, I together with all beings am awakened. Um, in the story of Jishan, who gave up and became a cooking monk, monk, thinking he was never going to wake up, he went and built a hut, and for company he planted bamboo. Now, I think the fact that that's what he did for company is very interesting. It tells us something. I don't know what it tells us. I won't go there. Um, I have one more story, and this is from Catherine Thanis, who I actually have practiced with a little bit. Um, the other day, as I was feeling not good about myself while coming to the Zendo, I caught a glimpse of the tree outside the front door, and I felt something from the tree. I looked away and then looked back. I felt so much love so much compassion, so much understanding emanating from the life of this tree. I thought, what is going on? I think I felt the suffering of the tree. It was silent, it was upright. It stood regardless of rain, snow, heat of summer, the tremendous change of weather conditions here at Tassajara. The tree was uncomplaining, it was just there. It supported this Zendo. It supported our life together, and it supported me. I felt so much support and compassion from its willingness to endure, to be its life. Oh, I thought, it's okay to be me. It's okay to be all the seasons of my life. And then she says, how does the heart open? Katagiri Roshi said, Zen practice is about the complete opening of the heart. You don't think this is a body practice? It is a complete opening of the heart. 
And so there are some stories. I haven't told my stories, but I have them. Um, because what I was looking to do was to ground myself in the rest of the Sangha. And now I want to go to Dogen in Bendoa. So this was perhaps the first of Dogen's writings that I fell in love with. The other one was Genjo Koan. But Bendoa, which we used to chant at noon service during Sashin at Minnesota Zen Center, um, I, it got my attention like a few words at a time. It's like I didn't comprehend it. And now it's like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. So Bendoa, the wholehearted way, mostly is about praise of Zazen. And it was written early in his career after he left, oh no, his teacher's temple and before he had a place of his own. He was just kind of parking someplace where they gave him a space. And at the beginning of Bendoa, he says, since I'm just floating like a cloud or duckweed, still there may be sincere students, so I'm writing this little thing. And I'm going to skip like several paragraphs where he talks about how incredible Zazen is. But then I'm going to read this one when even for a moment you sit upright in samadhi, expressing the Buddha mudra in the three activities, body, speech, and thought, the whole world of phenomena becomes the Buddha mudra, and the entire sky turns into enlightenment. Accordingly, all Buddha Tathagatas increase Dharma bliss, the original source, and renew their magnificence in the awakening of the way. Furthermore, all beings in the world of phenomena in the ten directions in the six paths, including the three lower paths, at once obtain pure body and mind, realize the state of great emancipation, and manifest the original face. At this moment, all things actualize true awakening. Myriad objects partake of the Buddha body. And sitting upright, a glorious one under the Bodhi tree, you immediately leap beyond the boundary of awakening. Um, so Zazen, I will say, is to sit in Zazen is to let things be the way they are and not adjust them according to our preconceived ideas. And, um, and what Dokken says is that when for even a moment you sit in this way, in samadhi, in one-pointedness, in wholehearted practice, you are expressing the Buddha mudra. You're expressing the shape and the form of the Buddha and of the Buddha's way. The whole world of phenomena becomes the Buddha way, becomes the expression of the Buddha's practice. And the entire sky turns into enlightenment. There is nothing else but enlightenment. The whole world of phenomena expresses the Buddha's teaching. And then more detail, because earth, grass, trees, walls, tiles, and pebbles in the world of phenomena in the 10 directions all engage in Buddha activity, those who receive the benefits of the wind and water are inconceivably helped by the Buddha's transformation, splendid and unthinkable, and intimately manifest enlightenment. So it's interesting to note that he does not only cite natural objects, he includes walls and tiles, human-made objects, all engage in Buddha activity.
And then he adds, grasses, trees, and lands that are embraced by this way of transformation together radiate a great light and endlessly expound the inconceivable profound dharma. So, so here it is, it's like everything, everything around us teaches. They expound the dharma. And so if we look back at Sushi's poem, 84,000 verses are heard throughout the night. The valley is the Buddha's body and the mountains. Now the valley are the Buddha's speech and the mountains are the Buddha's body. Grasses, trees, and lands that are embraced by this way of transformation together radiate a great light and endlessly expound the inconceivable profound dharma. Grass, trees, and walls bring forth the teaching to all people, including common people and sages. All beings in response extend this dharma to grass, trees, and walls. Thus, the realm of self-awakening and awakening others invariably holds the mark of realization with nothing lacking. And realization itself is manifested without ceasing for a moment. So when I was a child growing up, I was fortunate to live in a place where, um, where there were some wild spaces. There were flower gardens and there were lawns, but there was also the woods and the fields. There were cornflowers and Queen Anne's lace. There were raspberries to pick. There were trees. Um, oh, there were rattlesnakes, but anyway, um, and that was, that was what I loved. That was where home was, it was out there in those places that were not so controlled and that were beautiful in and of themselves. And I don't remember the thoughts that I had then. I just remember going out. Once, once the first, the first time I found the iris blooming in the wild, I just like gasped. It was so beautiful. It was just the shape of a flower. It was the um, pale lavender ones that people don't like very well, and um, and it was fragrant, and it was growing underneath some pine trees. And I came back and visited them throughout that spring. And then I came back the next year, but I didn't remember when it was. So I was out there in March. In Ohio, March is a little warmer than here. And then I was there in April and finally the flowers were there in May. And so every year until we moved, I would go and visit them. Every year, Every summer, I would go out to pick blackberries. I would walk down the lane, and I would sit underneath a row of pine trees that were off in the distance. And I would be nourished in the way that Catherine Thanis talks about, oh, oh. So when I discovered Zen, I didn't have words for that connection. It's like there was this feeling. It was a feeling that, no, I can't even say, I was going to say that everything is right with the world, but it wasn't a statement. It was just a feeling. Um, and I spent what time I could out in the places that seemed wild to me, um, watching the waves on the lake, um, climbing around the hills in the local wilderness preserve, watching the sunlight on the water in the creek in the late afternoon. And those were the things that nourished me. And then I came to Zen 
and I heard teachings that made sense in whatever way it was. And then I spent some time at Hokyoji because the city center is some, um, you know, it's got a nice backyard and it's on the lake. But at Hokyoji, I was like, oh, this is this is the holy place. You come to a place and you feel like it's holy. And you want to be there. You feel nourished by it. Well, I felt nourished by it, but I, I hear that this is not unusual. Um, when um, spiritual seekers want to spend some time, they usually, you know, they go off to caves and woods and forests. They go away from human civilization to find those places. So when Dogen speaks of the trees, trees, grasses, and lands, and walls, expounding the Dharma, is talking about the way that they teach us without words. They teach us in body. And, and that, that's my practice. I mean, I could I could put statements on on my practice, um, but <clears throat> what I'm aware of is the way that we support each other in the circle of the web. So when you sit us and you are supporting everything and everyone, and you are allowing them to support you. And this is the nature, the, the reality, um, the reality behind the superficial. This is an interdependent origination where everything creates everything else. Everything witnesses it and sees it. And by seeing each other or hearing each other, we create each other. So, um, so I recently, <clears throat> I've been writing about this. And then I thought, oh, I should actually try to teach this. And so I announced a class called Earth Apprenticeship, or Earth Apprentice Training, I think I called it. And I'm going to venture to offer to other people the thing that I have been studying with myself. Um, I would go, so I live on 17 acres. And I have sometimes gone out there, sometimes I make paths, and I feel fine about making paths. And sometimes I pull up weeds. And I've discovered that pulling up weeds involves me in the mind of killing. It involves me in the mind in which that thing and I are separate from each other, and that one is a problem, as if I were not a problem. So I belong to a subset of the human species that is waging war on the rest of the planet. Um, and so my practice, my land practice, is to attempt to give up that war for myself. And now I'm trying to teach people to give up that war. It was interesting. Yesterday, I went, invited some people to come and sow what wild rice with me. Um, a few weekends ago, I went up north, northern Minnesota, and to, to a rice camp. And we gathered rice in canoes, and we parched it, and we trampled it, and we winnowed it. And then right like at the end of my last day, there were some women making mud balls with the rice. And then they went out and put some of these mud balls back into the lake. And they said, it's what you do. You always give some rice back after you've harvested rice. And they also said, um, wild rice should grow everywhere. And so we want you. I, I, I said that I wanted some and I got some information about whether it would actually grow in my creek. And they said, planting wild rice 
not only establishes this indigenous thing, which has been stolen, it also helps restore the ecosystem. So, so I was out there with three other people and um, we we're kind of whacking our way through some buckthorn and something else. And um, I said something about a plant having use. And two people corrected me saying, you mean human use? And it was like, I was in good company. I'm the one who usually says that. But, but I had two people who said it back to me. And I said, you're my people. Um, anyway, so we, we planted rice. And then they took some and planted it in a couple of other places. And we'll see what happens. But we've invited the being wild rice into our territory. Um, so I think what what's happening these days in the general world, or maybe it's the world of spirituality, is that people are noticing the way Native Americans live and other indigenous people really everywhere live in relationship with the earth. And they recognize that we're all relatives and and they uh, learn to take care of things rather than, you know, destroying them and planting a field of wheat or something. Um, and so I learned from them and I've done a lot of reading, but I wanted to go back to my own tradition because I was certain that it's in my own tradition. And I have done a little reading uh, from from Cambodia because because it's it's like who you know is how you get the stories, and so I know more stories. And Buddhists in Cambodia definitely talk to the earth spirits, and they make prayers to the earth spirits, and they make offerings. Oh, there's this wonderful practice they have when you come into a new place. First, you introduce yourself to the place spirits, and then you tell them what your business is. So I learned this from an anthropologist who, what she does is study there. And now I've got a few books of hers, um, but she opened a door into Buddhism and shamanism. Although shamanism isn't probably the right word, but but the way of practice, it's like the more Buddhism moves from one place to another, and it settles in with the local, um, the local styles. So Buddhism went to China and got, nope, I don't know the right word. Um, it went to Tibet and it got involved with Bon, I think, which is a shamanic religion. It came to Japan and got involved with a very earth-based religion that was native. And I was like, I, I didn't plan ahead and I've lost my words. And so Buddhism came to America, or I'll say to North America. <clears throat> and there are places where it got involved with Native American people and um, they really talk about the connection. You know, whichever kind of Buddhist they're hanging out with, they, they see that it's the same thing. But then it came to Western civilization, that's us. And it took on some characteristics of our civilization. So one of those is being focused on personal enlightenment rather than the whole. One of them it is uh, not getting involved in taking care of things. It's, it's like it's like the um, Christian idea that all that matters is going to heaven when you die. And there's a Buddhist idea that all that happens, all that matters is your personal enlightenment. Of course, in Soto Zen, we don't think that. And yet, Soto Zen teachers have gotten severe criticism for getting involved in, for instance, activism. And 
So, um, so I'm I'm coming from the heart of that part of the culture, not so much materialistic part, but the religious part in which we're separate from nature and the world is sinful. And I'm fighting my way back. Well, fighting isn't the right word, is it? But sitting for long hours in front of a wall is very useful to me. And consciously rewriting the way I engage with the natural world is useful to me. So, so, so I'm starting to share and I'm continuing to learn. Um, in my sense of things, there's nothing that's not a sentient being. Everything is conscious. And so that puts me a little, a little outside of the mainstream. But, um, but it, it's the way it seems to me. So atoms and molecules, yep. Certainly plants, pebbles, rocks, the creek, the river, the buckthorn, the oaks, um, the air, the wind, the mosquitoes. Um, they're all teaching us. And um, And we also teach them, you know, we also give to them. This is, um, oh, there's an idea, and I think it's a Christian idea. I think it's actually a Protestant idea that sort of negates the world and negates having fun and negates enjoyment. And it says humans are evil, that original thin thing. But it's like people experience themselves that way. They experience each other's other at that way. That's easier to do because sometimes people behave badly. But experiencing ourselves as that way, I think, is not a Buddhist concept. In the Buddhist concept, we belong here. And we're part of the world. And there's nothing wrong. It's just greed, hate, and delusion are little problem or a big problem so um so i am uh, oh so i'm proposing that what we do with our with how we see ourselves is that we come home it's like repent means to turn back it's like, okay, turn back from a bunch of ideas that make the world much worse than it is. They're also literally making the world worse, like creating climate change and exterminating species and so forth. And we actually belong here. And if we could come to belong here, if we believe that we belong here, if we accept the embrace of all the beings around us, then we can start. And one of my things is ask for help from those other beings in our big problems. But I think the, the main thing I have to say is, you know, we belong here and let's allow ourselves to belong here. So I think that's that's what I'm offering and I would welcome questions and comments. Mm -hmm. Aaron Sure. You you mentioned um, your book, and I was just wondering, I, I assume a lot of what you said today was part of your book, but I was just wondering, maybe, could you speak a little bit more about that, how it's organized, what uh, you're... 
Sure. Yeah, I will. The book is currently at the agent, waiting, waiting. And I'm trying just to get on with my life. Um, so the original intention of the book was to encourage people to ask for help from the other beings. And in the process of writing that, I read some really exciting stuff. Um, I found that I needed to give, I, I had to offer images of how beautiful the world is and how it welcomes us. I had to research and present information about human beings that we are not basically sinful and evil and selfish because most of today's, I won't say most of today's world, most of what people in the United States in mainstream culture are hearing and mostly believe is that humans are selfish and evil and environmentalists, you know, the world would be so much better off without us. And I actually can't go there. Um, I think that we are part of the world and we have something to contribute. And then I finally go to, well, how do we practice with this and what, what might we do? And I have a proposal that people gather in small groups to um, form a relationship with their local earth beings and to ask them to help to save, to save themselves. Once, ooh, several years ago now, um, the land just north of me, which I considered part of my space, you know, it was just wild and nobody ever used it. It was sold and somebody got a building permit. And I, no wait, they didn't get a building. Permit. It was sold to somebody who wanted to build on it. And at the end of a five-day session, I spent my last afternoon out there walking in those woods, asking them to protect themselves from being destroyed by what I pictured was a modern suburban house and people paving and all this stuff. And I heard the trees talking back to me. I didn't hear them in words. It's like, that's not what I do. But I, I could feel them in the way Catherine Thanis talks about feeling that tree. <laughs> and so I went and relaxed. And like a year and a half later, I looked, looked up the zoning and I discovered that it had shifted. And so I thought that the shift meant that nobody could build there anymore. And a few years after that, I found out that wasn't true. And there is somebody who was put in a driveway. And I just kind of, and, and I've spoken with them and, and so forth, but they haven't built. Um, but I'm, I'm planted now. So it's, it's like, I, I think the spirits tricked me. And they said, okay, everything will be fine. And so I let it be, but you know, I didn't understand what they meant. I think they just got me to stay. And, you know, I'm talking about spirits as if they existed because they think they exist. I don't think we're the only people here. I don't think we're the only conscious people. And I don't think Buddhism thinks we're the only conscious people. <laughs> I have just adopted a style of talking about that because I'm trying to, to spread that thought and not just keep it within Oh, well, within Soto Zen, we have this concept of all sentient beings. Um, and so I talk about spirits and people. And, um, and then I try to explain myself. Let's see. Okay. So that, that was, you can ask me more questions, but that's kind of the direction of the book. It's like, okay. I mean, it's, it's great to protest, lobby, bring lawsuits and we need all those things. But also we need, people get so discouraged and burnt out when they do those things. You know, I meet such people, they're exhausted and often angry. 
And so I want to bring in the fact that we're not alone. Even if 90% of Western civilization is against us, we are not alone on this planet in wanting to be connected and in caring and in not being gods. People think we're gods. We're not. <laughs> People don't notice they think we're gods. Anyway, so some of that's what, what the book is about. And the book does not do much in Buddhism, but I've thought, oh, the next book might be like really Buddhist to bounce back from that. But I can't think about a next book now. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Also, if anybody wants to argue with me, that, that would be fun. Well, thank you, uh, Shoto. I uh, was uh, interested when you were talking about weeds. Uh, weeds. 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 Oh, weeds, yes, right. Uh, Hokyoji has no shortage of weeds, but uh, I got a little philosophical about this once, and I decided to go to the dictionary and look up, what is a weed? <laughs> yes, what did they say? All it says is it's a plant that's not wanted. <laughs> it's not right. Wanted right, by yeah. uh, human beings, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, that was kind of a help, helpful way to think of it. As mm -hmm. if weed is something, you know, undesirable. Mm -hmm. But it is. I mean, it's a plant that we do not desire to be in the place where it is. That's all. It's a pretty... That's exactly. <laughs> Pretty generic oh. definition. Yes, uh, right. Oh, so here's this book. I uh, started, I thought maybe I had something from here. It's called Beyond the War on Invasive Species. And the uh, end of the book, it's got all these high quality literary references or scientific references, right? But what the basic thing is, is that, okay, so we see an invasive species other than ourselves, and we immediately try to destroy it, <laughs> completely forgetting. We think we have the right, but um, we completely, so, so it's like as if we were the ones who knew what should happen. And, um, and so there are several stories. One of them is salt cedars on the Colorado River the one I remember, but people like actually obliterating all the invasive species and then something really horrible happens to the ecosystem because they weren't thinking. So I have the thought here that it's like I've done some of that. I got a grant once and pulled up all the buckthorn on an acre. Um, it didn't seem to hurt things, but the buckthorn is coming back because they didn't know what was supposed to take its place. Um, and so a little humility. And so the, the earth apprentice training that I'm doing is going to be, how do we listen carefully enough and closely enough to actually get what should happen here, what the land needs to happen here, and um, and to make that our basis for actions that we take here. And I, it's going to be slow, but at least it's least, instead of going, you know, off that way, I, at least we're going in, in the appropriate direction. I don't like saying right. Well, thank you. Uh... As you were speaking, I thought, <clears throat> I don't know if I've ever thought this before, but uh, I'm sure I'm not the first. Probably, you know, the ultimate invasive species is human beings. <laughs> yes. So I know a lot of people who think that, but it's not human beings. It's um, 
it's a certain group of human beings mm -hmm. that seem to be focused in Europe and have spread contagiously. Yeah. Um, so I recently well, you have, you know, it's just a con you know a certain kind of species of human beings that's uh, right spreading. <laughs> so I mean, yeah, who knows? Uh, but anyway. yeah. Have you ever read Ishmael by Daniel Quinn? Ishmael? Ishmael? Ishmael. Ishmael? No, I, I read the book. It starts out, call me Ishmael, but uh, Moby Dick. <laughs> but, oh, right. Yeah. No. Uh, no, no, I haven't read that book. So Okay. Sorry. Ishmael. So it's, it's fiction, and he won an award for it, and then he wrote several more books. But he takes a look at human history, and what he says specifically about that humans are this kind of thing. Um, he says, most of the cultures of the world have just gone on. And, you know, like if they make a mistake, like building a city that can't be sustained and it's ruining the land around it, they walk away. They just they just drop it. And, you know, you know, some of these, um, what is it in the southwestern U.S.? There's people called the Hohokam, which sort of means they're not here. Um, Mesa Verde was built by people who walked away. Um, Tenac, you know, I'm not sure. I think the Mayans, they had these great cities and now they just grow corn. Um, <laughs> so, and there, there are various sources of stories of people who did that. And we come from the people who said, no, this is, this is the only way to live. And and we stopped evolution, you know. It's like okay, nothing better is going to happen. Whereas everybody else was like, yeah, okay. So, well, and I mean, it might be generations, but it's like okay, we don't like this, so we're just going to do something else. And um, our people said no, and so if it doesn't work, they just try harder, doing the same thing. And we know that Albert Einstein said about that. It's like they keep doing the same thing. It's like, oh, let's build more machines. Let's build more factories. Let dig more mines. But whatever we can, we can't abandon our way of consumption and we can't abandon being the masters of the universe. And I mean, they get, and I just have to say crazy. It's like, the, it's ridiculous the thing that, things that modern humans do. They think they can tell it colonize Mars when we're in on the planet that's like perfectly suited to human life <laughs> you know it's like so there's a uh, there's there's an insanity and actually I thought once upon a time I read a biography of the Buddha that suggested to me that he came from a culture that was not like that. It was the old sane way of living. And that Buddhism kind of brings something of that culture forward. And so for instance, we have all sentient beings and we have nonviolence and some other stuff like that. And, and so now I'm sitting in the middle of a collapsing civilization, which needs to collapse, but it's going to be painful. It's already painful. And because I have Buddhism, I have some place to go. I, I have I have a, a another way that says, oh, you can let go of that. You can let go of that and you can still be here. So and and that's 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 kind of like my my polit that's that's where my politics and my Buddhism come together. It's like, oh, we don't we actually don't have to be like that. We don't have to be trying to kill everything around us. So. <laughs> Thank you for your questions. And I know it's it's like I'm talking freely because I think that's my job right now. But I'm certainly in favor of more more comments or questions.
Uh, thanks for the talk, Shoto. Um, I, uh, my teacher is fond of saying that uh, the Buddha um, taught uh, 84,000 teacher teaches uh, teachings. Oh. Sorry, I, I uh, am not in the um, probably not in good shape to be talking freely myself. I, I went from study to cooking as a cooking monk. Uh, so oh. it's I'm uh, um, frazzled, I guess. But yeah, so 84,000 teachings. Um, and uh, in part of what you read from Dogen, it said that uh, each plant uh, teaches the 84,000 teachings. So I really appreciated that each expression is the complete whole of uh, the teachings itself. Um, so that kind of landed on me. It's like, it's not part of it. It's just each and everything completely expresses uh, the completeness of, of these teachings of reality as it is. So I, I appreciate that. Well, that's good. You actually added something there. <laughs> Which and part? Think, Tell me. Well, so I had never heard that the Buddha gave 84,000 teachings. So you added the thought that each teaching, so each plant or each whatever, you know, say my hand, gives the whole teaching. But I like that a great deal. Um, maybe uh, a few more minutes. Uh, we could have time for one more question, or if we want to stop, that's fine. Anyone have a a comment? Hmm. Can't tell. It. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you, Tyken. Yeah, I'm. Uh, my comment is just that. Uh, this was a wonderful Dharma talk, uh, and it connects with a lot of things that I have thought um, and feeling I, that I feel the older I get. Um, and so I'm, I'm both sad about what's happening to the planet and totally delighted by the fact that some people are on it and, uh, and that it's part it's part of the universe it's part of it's part of everything and if you look at the the photo the uh telescope uh pictures that have been taken of you know one billion years after the big bang and so on and we all fit into this it's all part of us we're made out of stardust and that's all I can think about to say. <laughs> nice. I have just this little comment. One of the things that I'm doing, it's like, so I am constantly feeling guilty because I didn't go up to get arrested at line three. And I didn't, I did mm -hmm. do something about the Keystone KXL, but, but mostly it's like, I'm sitting here, I'm doing my practice, working at a job to support me. And, um, and you know writing or something and i know people who are risking their lives mm -hmm. but the other thing is my thought about you know asking asking for help from the other beings is like it doesn't require you to go someplace and it doesn't mm -hmm. require you to risk your life or to be able-bodied or able to leave your job or any of that um, in Indian country, they say, they're always saying, so as a result of my travels, I have a lot of Native people on my Facebook page, and somebody will post something, and everybody go, prayers up. And so I'm doing prayers up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you so much for listening. If I can add uh, what Tyken just said, I saw recently the picture of, uh, I guess it was a picture of Earth from the uh, from Voyager, the spaceship, and it was just this tiny little speck, and it had uh, Carl Sagan's 
famous quote. It's like uh, he goes on and on about everything, every person you've ever known, every person that's ever been here, uh, every all the suffering that's that has ever happened that you know about or that has ever happened in human history is just on this tiny speck. So it's this big picture of black and then just this little bitty. You can't even tell it's blue. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 a big, big universe, this thing. Oh, that's good. I think I've seen that picture. Yeah. What it had, it had these words on it with a little arrow, and it says, you are here. <laughs> yeah, Sagan, he said some wonderful things. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. This was a pleasure. Thank you, Shodal-san. Um, <clears throat> a few up. Oh. Coming announcements, we have a just sitting retreat at Hokyoji from uh, October 17th to October 22nd. We have two retreats in November, one read, led by uh, Mark uh, Rice uh, Anderson, calling Naturally Awake. It's uh, November 9th through 12th, and another one by uh, GD, Gentle Dragon, Onru Kennedy. From 1116 to 1119, and title of that retreat is um, This Present Moment. At least that's a, a summary of the title. And then we have our Rohatsu uh, retreat, and that's December 2nd through December 9th. And that will be led by Myo'o, Heaven Master, and also Kyoku uh, Weyland, a resident of Okyoji. So that's the upcoming events for the rest of this year. <clears throat> and um, as always, we are dependent upon uh, your generosity for Hokyoji to continue. Yes, if you're inclined to make a donation, please uh, go to our website and do so. Finally, uh, let's close with the uh, with three or four vowels. And I'm going to switch uh, original sound here. To, to uh, what do you call it? Musicians? Oh, okay. <clears throat> Beings are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are in I vow to enter them. The Buddha is unsurpassable. I vow to realize them. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. And it's nice to see you all and have a, a good rest of your Sunday. Take good care. See you next week, I hope. Bye-bye.